bread is amazing. Anywhere you go in Ecuador, whether you're in the city or if you're out in the middle of nowhere, there's always a little bakery on the corner. And every morning they come out with fresh rolls and fresh chocolate bread that is just to die for. It's, it's better than anything I've ever tasted in the United States. If you serve in Ecuador, you'll eat rice every single day. And not just a little pile of rice, a whole mountain of rice. Um, in addition to rice, uh, it depends a lot on the area. Uh, if you're in an area out in the country, you'll get a lot of fried bananas, a lot of fried bananas, a lot of chicken, lentils. They have a, a lentil thing called menestra, where they put like cheese and lard in. It's actually really, really good. Those are like the typical dishes, the typical things that you'll get. And then obviously, you know, there's, there's the weird stuff. You know, they make soup with cow intestines and there's a really, really popular dish with cow stomach called uh, guatita with a really good peanut sauce. And it's, it's a little off putting the first time you eat it, but it's really common there. So, you know, the third or fourth times you eat it, it actually starts getting good to me anyway. A lot of fried food. If you're on the coast, a lot of fried fish a lot of fried chicken. It's definitely a different culture. I think the first thing that I noticed about them just in my first week there is in Ecuador they point with their lips, which is really off-putting the first time you see it. You know, when you're on the street and you see somebody go, hey, look at that, over there. So, you know, that kind of freaked my family out when I first got home and I was still doing it. Um, the people there are, are awesome. They are so open and so generous. Uh, you know, we would have people that would open up their doors and they'd say, hey, come in and eat something. And we'd be like, can we share a message? They'd be like, no, we're Catholic. We don't want to hear your message, but come in and eat something anyway. They were just so hospitable and, and so open. And I think that that, that was the best thing that, that I learned about their culture and the thing that I love the most about the Ecuadorian people is just how generous they were. Generous and open with, with everything. I mean, you would, you would eat lunch at a member's house that just lived in a little bamboo hut and they would give you everything they had and they wouldn't even eat lunch because they were giving it to you, everything that they had. Uh, and that was, that was really, uh, really humbling. Most people that have heard about Latin America have heard of Carnival, which is in February. And that is a real party. Pretty much three days of just people throwing water balloons and mud and they have big cans of silly string that are this big that they spray each other with. So that's a lot of fun, even if you're just watching it from a window. Um, and, and New Year's there is a huge deal. It's a lot bigger than Christmas. Christmas is usually just like a, a nice dinner that you have with your family. Maybe you give away some presents. Then people get really, really excited for New Year's. And in Ecuador, they have one of the funnest New Year's traditions that, that I've ever heard of. They call them monigotes or quemar el viejo. Um, they're basically just big paper mache like mannequins. And they usually make them from like, like popular movies like Iron Man, The Avengers, or, or maybe animated movies like Tangled or, or Frozen. And they usually spend all the month of December making them. Really, really intricate, really detailed. And then on the night of the 31st, they pack them full of explosives. And right as the clock hits 12, they blow them up which is really fun to watch. Literally every single house has at least one in Monigote out in the street in front of it, just blowing up right at 12 o'clock midnight. And uh, that's something that, that was really new for me the first time I saw it. In my first area, I was, like I said, in a, a beach town, and that was right during uh, the New Year's. And it's really traditional in Ecuador to go to the beach whenever there's a vacation. So it just filled up uh, with tourists and with people that were coming from Guayaquil and all over Ecuador. And on New Year's, it was, it was just insane. There were monigotes that were three stories high. They, they were just burning out in the middle of the street. So that was, that was a lot of fun. And it definitely caught me by surprise the first time. People in Ecuador are really poor. There are some really nice areas that frankly look just like a neighborhood in the United States. But once you get outside of Guayaquil, once you get into the slums, there's a lot of really, really poor people, a lot of poverty. Um, but I mean, they're, they're people just like us and they have the same values and the same wants that we do. They just want their family to be happy. They want their family to be provided for. It's something that kind of caught me by surprise, and this might go for all of Latin America. They're a lot more touchy. Um, if you come into a room, it's you pretty much have to shake everyone's hand, and when you leave, you have to shake everyone's hand. And that happens always if you're just you know meeting somebody for the first time, or if you're old friends, if you're coming to a group of people, shake everybody's hands in the groups, and then when you leave, uh, do the same thing. That was something that kind of caught me by surprise. They have a lot of faith in God. Most of them are Catholics. There are a few Jehovah's Witnesses there that you'll run into every once in a while. Um, a few evangelists that, you know, have their drums and their electric guitars in their churches that are really easy to hear. You'll definitely see a lot of those. But most of the people are just quiet. Most of the people just have, you know, good, good family values. They believe in 
in the Bible. They believe in, in a lot of the same things that we do, just in, uh, they sometimes have a different way of expressing it. There are so many different kinds of bananas. Um, and I, I never even realized that until I went to Ecuador. There's these really, really little ones. I, I don't even know what they're called in English. In fact, I don't remember what they're called in Spanish either, but they're really, really good. They have a lot more like of that banana flavor that you don't get a lot of. And that I think is the biggest difference between the bananas here and the bananas there. They're just fresher and more flavorful. Um, like I said, the members would give us just whole branches of bananas that we would hang up in our kitchens. And every morning, um, you know, you wake up and breakfast for me anyway, was just a couple of bananas and, and maybe a, a thing of bread. And, and I loved it because the bananas, they were amazing. I mean, you're just picking it right off the branch and it's, it's yellow when they cut it. And, and I loved it. I mean, for me that I, now I know why all the world gets their bananas from Ecuador. They use bananas in like desserts. They make like a banana pudding, which is like crushed up bananas with, they put cheese in it and, uh, and milk and brown sugar, which is really good. They fry just about every kind of banana. They cut them up into little pieces and fry them. They cut them up into big pieces and fry them. They crush them and they fry them. They slice them and they fry them. Uh, fried bananas are just a way of life in Ecuador. And they actually, in my opinion, they combine really, really well with the Ecuadorian food. Um, they have a really good dish called arroz con pollo, which is rice with chicken. And it's kind of like a stir fry, but they always cut up like really, really ripe bananas, like brown bananas. They're so ripe and they fry them and they put them over the stir fry and you eat the whole thing kind of together. And the first time I saw it, it was, it was a little strange, but it is really, really, really good because the brown bananas are really sweet. And when they're fried, it gives them kind of that like smoky flavor. And it's, it's amazing. It's to die for. I, I did have red bananas in one of my areas. Um, they're not as common because most of the bananas that they grow in Ecuador are for export. So they're the kind of, you know, normal bananas that we would think of. But the two that, that I really got into were the little bananas that are just really, really flavorful. And there are red bananas there too, that they also fry. You know, they, they did tell us that we had to eat bananas every single morning because that's how we would keep our energy. And you know, it helped me. I always ate bananas in the morning and always had energy. <laughs> they speak pretty good Spanish. They're, they're pretty clear. They don't have a, a really heavy accent in the, in the, uh, the mountains of Ecuador. It's, it's really different. So if you run into, run into somebody who's from, it's called a Sierra. Uh, they're sometimes impossible to understand because they have a really interesting way of saying things. For example, like normal Spanish, you'd say carro, which means cars, and they say carro, which, you know, when you say it by itself, it sounds easy to recognize, but when they just start spouting that off, it's, it's really, really tough. You know, Ecuador, like any Latin American country, has its, its words that are unique to that country. Um, they say chévere, like for cool. Um, they say chévere and bacán. Uh, they say pelucón, which means like rich. And as far as I know, those words are, are unique just to Ecuador, uh, according to my Latin companions anyway. So there's a, a language called Quichua, which is really common on the eastern half of Ecuador. You definitely hear some words that get transferred over. The only one I can remember right now is, is the Ecuadorian word for hangover, which is resaca which is a Quichua word, and pretty much everybody uses that in Ecuador. The main indigenous city in Ecuador is called Otavalo, um, and the people from there are called Otavaleños, and they're known for having the, the ponytail in the back. I was lucky on my mission. I was actually never robbed. Um, I was like the only missionary in the entire mission to have that happen to me. A lot of it's just being smart. You know, if you see a dark alleyway, even if it's a faster way to get home or a faster way to get to your investigator's house and you feel something bad, go around, don't go down it. Generally good to avoid unlit streets. If we saw somebody that we knew was definitely, you know, uh, a drug dealer or a bad guy, for the most part, if it was daytime, we would always go over and say hi to him. We'd go over, hey, we're the missionaries, you know, we've got a message about God and we, you know, we like to talk to your family, how's it going? They would always turn us down, but it kind of created that familiarity. And then the next time we saw them, we'd just be like, hey, how's it going? And we'd learn their names, hey, Miguel, how's it going? And they would learn our names, hey, Eldridge. So it just kind of created that familiarity and, and it was never a problem. Um, and, you know, there were people that we knew were doing really bad things. We would hear about, you know, them robbing people. The members would sometimes even tell us specific things about specific people that we knew. But they never bothered us as long as, you know, we, we were nice and we didn't get in their way and we were smart. Just know where the dangerous areas are at night. The biggest one was Latin King. And they're mostly a, a drug gang. They operate, you know, like heroin, marijuana. And they're really, really strong in the poorer areas. We were actually lucky uh, because there's a new 
president in Ecuador, not not super new, but recently elected, and he's done a pretty decent job of cracking down on corruption in the police. So the the police have gotten a lot better in Ecuador. Still, definitely not you know very good, I would say, but they've gotten a lot better and they've done a, a decent job of of improving crime. So it's it's not quite as prevalent as it was you know ten or fifteen years ago, but it's still very much a part of especially the rural and and poorer areas. People know who the gangsters are and they they try to stay away from them. They're scared of them. But in general, it's not a huge, huge deal in most of the places that I was in. First and foremost, Quevedo is a a farming town. It's surrounded by banana plantations. Chances are, anywhere in the United States, if you pick up up a banana and it says Ecuador, it came from Quevedo. And, And that's what most people do for work. Most of the people that we talk taught had some connection to the banana industry. They either worked in the banana fields or they were managers of, you know, the banana processing plants or they worked for a pesticide company that worked for the banana plantations. So pretty much everything in Cabello revolved around uh, the banana production, which, you know, was great for me because I love bananas. Um, You know, the members would just give us huge branches just full of bananas every week and you could just pick them off and eat them whenever you wanted. It was it was amazing. Um, as far as Quevedo goes, it is a, a pretty poor city because um, m- most of the people there just kind of work out in the banana fields and they don't make very much. There's a lot of dirt roads. Most of Quevedo is made up of, of dirt streets and, and bamboo houses. Most of the lower class in Ecuador lives in bamboo houses with, uh, with tin roofs and wooden floors. And that was what I would say the majority of the people there lived in. Uh, and if not that, there would be brick, you know, brick houses. Uh, with with cement and and tin ceilings, that was pretty typical in Cabello. Uh, transportation depended on which area you were in. Uh, some areas were small enough that you could get everywhere pretty easily by walking. Other areas you would take uh, buses. We didn't have any bikes anywhere in the mission. Um, it was it was a bit dangerous for that. Um, but fortunately, everywhere in the mission, and this was especially true in Cabello because it was a very dangerous city. Uh, the people know the missionaries, and they don't they don't really bug them. I mean, they, they have their, you know, shady stuff going on, but they don't bother the missionaries. They know us. We know them. We don't bother each other. Uh, more than anything, it's just a really, really great place to live because the people there are even more open than they are in Guayaquil because uh, a lot of people, most people, live day to day. You know, they get their, their paycheck at the end of the day. They're, they're 10 or $15, and so they have a lot of faith. Because they have faith that things will work out, even though they don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow. They don't know if there'll be work tomorrow. Um, and and that's something that translates really well into the gospel, that kind of faith. Something that I learned a lot from. It's hot pretty much all year round. The thing is, the thing with Ecuador, and pretty much anywhere you go on the coast, there's a wet season and a dry season. There's no colder, warm season because it's always hot. The wet season is from December till around April. And when it's during the wet season, it rains all the time and it pours. It, I mean, I've seen the biggest storms in my life in Ecuador. You know, rain up to your calves, up to your waist, rainwater. Uh, that's, that's the fun time. And when it's not the rainy season, it actually hardly ever rains. When it's like May through November, it's very, very rare to see it rain. But when, it's, when it is the rainy season, every single night, some afternoon, some mornings, but every single night, it pours.